Kia ora koutou. Ko Maureen Benson Ray Aho. Um, I'm an associate professor in international business here at the Business School. Um, I lead the international business discipline. Um, I've been working on Europe since I was an undergraduate and um, in, in many, many different roles. I now sit as a board member on the New Zealand Europe Business Council, um, but I also there speak up for the British New Zealand Business Association because we're talking Europe, not just EU. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce our two speakers today. I've just been told that our time's been cut by um, five minutes, so we'll keep this really to time and um, be focused and insightful. So um, I won't read out Stephen's bio in order to save some time. You've got it in the program. Um, Stephen Cartwright is the British Consul General and Trade Counselor at the British Consulate here in Auckland. He's held very various roles as a career diplomat. He's also had international business experience, the combination um, including India, if you um, want to speak to him about that. And in his speech today, he'll cover an update on the UK, um, New Zealand FTA, CPTPP, um, from a UK perspective, and touch on the broader trade vision and tech supporting sustainability. Thanks very much, Stephen. Thank you. I'm going to use. Uh, I'm going to stand up. We should all be standing up, really. But anyway, hopefully, in a few minutes, we'll stand up and we'll get a coffee. So I'm going to move rapidly through this. <laughs> Tena koto katoa. Thank you to ATEPS for inviting me to speak today. It's great to see so many MFAT graduates here as well. Good luck in your futures. Um, my top tip for today is simply to keep a list of acronyms to hand who's in the who's there and what they're doing. So that's my top tip. We do gather here at a, a time of great challenge, but also, I think, opportunity, and hopefully that's been reflected already so far. The UK and New Zealand are united by shared histories, culture, value, we all know that. And they're central to how we think about how we both act on the world stage. We both believe strongly in global responses to global problems and challenges, which are in stark focus, given the crisis unfolding in the Middle East at the moment. Comparing our assessments and view of the world and its dangers, it is clear that there is much we see eye to eye on and many opportunities to work together. To help put some of these opportunities into practice, the UK has doubled its diplomatic presence in the South Pacific in the past few years. We're co-located with New Zealand in three out of the six high commissions. And there is much more we can do with Pacific partners on issues that matter to them, such as resilience and long-term sustainability particularly. We also work together in the wider Indo-Pac region, for example, as common ASEAN dialogue partners in the wider world through shared membership of the UN, Commonwealth, Five Eyes Grouping, and the World Trade Organization. It's at times like these, though, that like-minded champions of openness, pluralateralism, and the rules-based international order need to affirm our partnership of course, one of the most important of these is in trade. It's almost six months since the platinum, we call it platinum, standard free trade agreement between New Zealand and the UK came into effect. My team was proud to host the event celebrating entry into force here in Auckland with MFAT and other partners in the room. Thank you. Our FTA combines New Zealand's innovation on trade policy with the UK's scale and global reach. As you know, the deal removes tariffs, simplifies customs procedures, improves business mobility and investment opportunities, and supports digital trade. Yes, Steph. It's also groundbreaking for its inclusion of the Maori Trade and Economic Cooperation Chapter, which recognises the importance and value of Maori to New Zealand's economy and society, and the unique, the unique relationship between the UK, New Zealand, and Maori. Unlocking the current and future potential of women's economic empowerment by working together to support women business owners, entrepreneurs and workers to fully access opportunities of international trade is also central to our FTA. But the FTA is not the only part of our trade relationship with New Zealand. The UK Secretary of State for Business and Trade, Kemi Badenoch, was here in Auckland in July to officially sign the UK into membership of the CPTPP. And the UK is delighted to become the first new member and to join this extraordinary community of now 12 economies spanning Asia, the Pacific, and now Europe. And last week, the UK attended its first meeting as a member 
in um, San Francisco. The joint ministerial statement reaffirmed the commitment to ensuring the agreement is dynamic and living and that it remains the gold standard for trade agreements. Our membership of this exciting, growing and forward-looking group demonstrates that the UK is open for business. In turn, with the UK as a member, CPTPP will have a combined GDP of 12 trillion pounds, that's a big number, and account for 15% of global GDP. But CPTPP is more than about boosting exports and imports. It's about the future, the world we want to live in. So the UK will use our seat at the table to reinforce the importance of CPTPP's free trading ideology, while upholding each country's right to regulate according to their own national requirements. The UK joining CPTPP will support our shared priorities, such as supporting the rules-based international trading system, championing the role of free and fair trade, and supporting innovation and sustainability. Our membership will support our mutual economic security by deepening participation in each other's supply chains and diversifying our trade. But the opportunities created by trade agreements like the FTA and CPTPP are of limited use unless they are understood and capitalised on. We're working hard to implement the FTA, including setting up the various subcommittees, 19 of them, and working groups that will provide the platform for further improvements. And over the coming months, we will continue to work here and in the UK and with our partners in MFAT, NZT and many other stakeholders to ensure business and communities understand and benefit from the opportunities of both the bilateral FTA and CPTPP. The UK's new independent trade policy has a broad vision to place the UK in the middle of a network of free trade agreements, making our country a global hub for businesses and investors who want to trade dynamic areas of the world, especially in the Indo-Pacific. This region matters to the UK. It's critical to our economy, our security, and our global ambition to support open societies and free and fair trade. In the decades to come, the Indo-Pacific region will be at the centre of many of the most pressing global challenges, from climate and biodiversity to maritime security. Our free trade agreement and the accession to CPTPP is a demonstration of that vision. At a time when protectionist barriers are on the rise, all countries do need to work together to ensure long-term prosperity and international trade is central to this cooperation. The UK, as an independent member of the WTO, will be a global champion of free trade. We will be an active and natural partner of New Zealand, seeking to work closely together in the upcoming 13th Ministerial Conference and upholding the values and rules of the WTO. Beyond trade, the UK and New Zealand work closely together on climate change and sustainability. This includes increasing capacity for renewable energy in New Zealand, and there are plenty more opportunities to build on this. The UK is also a world leader of technology and innovation, and that's built on collaboration, and it's collaboration that will be essential for the future. Consequently, we're proud of our landmark research, science and innovation arrangement with New Zealand, signed at prime ministerial level last year. This gives a platform to deepen our cooperation with New Zealand's outstanding science and research community in many, many areas. One is Agritech. Agritech is a tangible example of UK and New Zealand collaboration in the science and technology and trade space with an area with immense scope for collaboration. We regularly support delegations of UK companies to New Zealand looking for collaborative opportunities and work with Kiwi companies to grow their business in the UK. I'm delighted that a delegation of UK companies in the agritech space arrived yesterday in New Zealand and they're traveling throughout New Zealand over the coming days. And I mention this because as we've reflected on the panel earlier, it's this industry-led collaboration which will lead to solutions and future cooperation that deal with some of the world's problems. And therefore it is for us to be industry-led and then for government, regulators and other stakeholders to support and enable this. So the UK and New Zealand relationship is as important as ever in our trade partnerships, share prosperity, in defending our security, in upholding democracy and human rights, and in navigating the difficult geopolitical currents in an increasingly contested world. Our friends are our greatest strength. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, so um, it's my pleasure to introduce Diane Lacoste. Um, she's the brand new head of trade at the delegation of the European Union to New Zealand. And very pertinently for today, she recently completed a posting as counselor at the mission of the European Union to the WTO. Um, Diane, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kia ora. Uh, a real pleasure to be here, uh, as you said, the first for me here in uh, ATEPS, uh, and uh, as I, I've recently joined the EU delegation uh, in Wellington. Uh, uh, very interested by, by the, the discussions we've uh, been having today. Uh, and actually, I will um, probably uh, only expand on some of the, uh, of, of the thoughts that we shared this morning. Um, I was thinking, as, as this panel is, on, is, is focused on, on sustainable futures, on, on really focusing on this issue of trade and sustainability, uh, and more particularly with, uh, with three points. Uh, first, the changing demands on trade. Second, the new momentum behind trade and sustainability, uh, especially as the EU-New Zealand trade agreement is a very good illustration of that and the need for a comprehensive approach, and that's where the WTO will fit in. Um, so the new, the new demands on, on trade, uh, I mean, we've already also touched upon that in the first session. Um, I mean, it goes without saying that trade now um, uh, needs to do more uh, in, in what uh, some call the, the, the past globalization era, uh, trade uh, was mostly about boosting growth, uh, creating jobs. It was about opening market, uh, lifting trade barriers. Now, uh, some argue that we, are, we have entered a post-globalization era. Uh, and, and as part of that, uh, trade is, uh, needs to deliver a, on a much broader agenda, uh, which is much more geopolitical, of course. Uh, but um, which includes also broader uh, objectives and, and typically sustainability is part of these. So this is not that this is new. Uh, we had discussed trade ends uh, for, for quite some time, uh, but it's clearly uh, getting a higher profile uh, and the demand is more pressing on the sustainability side. Uh, so we've probably shifted on trade and sustainability from a nice to have to a must-have, uh, and this is probably also uh, a, a driver for for a for renewed social license around trade. Um, uh, and the EU New Zealand, and that's my second point. The EU New Zealand FTA is uh, is a reflection of that trend. Um, uh, as you may know, uh, the European Commission has a five-year uh, mandate. Uh, and as part of this five-year mandate, um, it uh, issues a trade strategy. And the last one was issued in uh, 2021, uh, and it's very much meant to articulate uh, with domestic policies, uh, with re the green and the digital transformation being really key priorities uh, for the current commission, uh, and of course to respond to global challenges. Uh, hence, this focus uh, in, the, in this new trade strategy on an open, sustainable, and assertive trade policy. And this sustainability dimension has been um, fleshed out, uh, uh, especially with a, a new orientation set out in June 2022. Uh, and, and that trade strategy is clearly the most sustainable uh, we've ever had. Um, interestingly, at the same time, the EU and New Zealand were negotiating a trade agreement, uh, and, and we, uh, the two partners clearly share uh, a very high level of emission on sustainability. Um, they, they have a high degree of like-mindedness, and that really contributed to uh, them being able to converge on an approach uh, on sustainability in the FTA that is pretty groundbreaking. And that approach, uh, as mentioned earlier today, uh, includes a variety uh, of, uh, of tools or, or path. Uh, there's the traditional toolbox of um, uh, promoting the removal of tariffs, of uh, promoting services that help with the green transition. Uh, but there's also uh, a whole new dimension of enhanced engagement, enhanced cooperation, 
uh, with partners um, uh, on the basis of the existing international framework and of the existing standards, be it in the field of uh, climate, environment, or, or labor, for instance. Uh, and beyond that, there is also uh, new uh, issues that are being uh, addressed, such as, for instance, uh, inclusivity. Um, uh, as part of this approach, there's also a, a much stronger uh, focus on implementation and compliance. Uh, and importantly, much more engagement with civil society with the sense that joint efforts uh, are necessary to uh, support uh, um, uh, progress on, on sustainability. Um, so uh, from an EU perspective, th this new approach has clearly resonated well uh, with our policymakers uh, and with the, the public uh, at large. Uh, as you know, the ratification process uh, is underway. Uh, and actually, we, we should have very good news this week uh, because the, uh, the uh, European Parliament uh, is now considering the agreement uh, and uh, it is actually sitting now in plenary session uh, and it will have a debate today on the agreement and is expected to give its consent tomorrow. Uh, and uh, um, also a positive news, uh, the, the, the Spanish presidency, we have rotating presidency uh, at the level of the European Union and the Spanish presidency um, has decided to speed up uh, the adoption of the, or the, the conclusions around the agreement uh, for member states uh, and we should be able to have a, a conclusion uh, also from member states by the end of this month. So that would be the end of the, of the, the ratification uh, process. And interestingly, I mean, the parliament uh, has always been um, uh, pushing a little bit the commission on the sustainability part of things, uh, of what we have in our, in our trade agreements. Um, and they've been very positive on uh, what's included in the EU New Zealand trade agreements uh, with a lot of praise around uh, the fact that this agreement uh, clearly sets uh, a gold standard uh, and calls to replicate that approach uh, in other agreements uh, that we are negotiating. Last point, uh, the need for a comprehensive approach. Um, of course, every step is important, every agreement is important, and that's why uh, the EU now includes a trade and sustainability chapter uh, according to this new approach uh, in each of our new agreements. Um, but as mentioned uh, earlier today, uh, sustainability is first and foremost a global challenge that requires global solutions. Um, so uh, there is a, a, a role for the rules-based trading system to need more closely into this issue. Uh, uh, and as EU, we believe that uh, trade and environment, trade and climate should be part of those issues that get a, a higher profile as part of the, the reform of the WTO if the organization is to become more relevant. Um, we've seen that the organization was able to take some steps, uh, including on the negotiating side uh, via the, the fisheries subsidies agreement. Uh, but irrespective of negotiations, uh, predictability and certainty uh, in the international trading system are very key um, uh, on, on both the tariff and not tariff side uh, to support the transition to a low carbon uh, economy. And uh, um, that was also touched upon earlier today, uh, the role of the WTO on the monitoring and transparency side. Um, especially as, as we know, the WTO is going through difficult uh, days, so cooperation and dialogue are becoming even more important. Uh, especially at a time where a number of national jurisdictions are adopting a number of national measures, and the EU is well placed <laughs> to say that. Uh, and, and that dialogue is important to help ensuring that international rules are uh, respected and that all these uh, different uh, um, legislation basically uh, contribute to achieving common objective. Uh, and that's why we, uh, we do believe that MT13 uh, which is around the corner, clearly has a role to play um, as an opportunity to take further steps into WTO on the sustainability agenda. 
Um, so to conclude, uh, that makes a lot of, of demand on, on trade, uh, and trade, trade is uh, definitely there uh, and can help uh, to make significant progress. Um, uh, it also requires more agility on the trade side, break, breaking uh, silos amongst uh, policy communities to discuss uh, things that are not really traditional. Uh, but also, we need uh, uh, realism. Uh, trade is one tool as part of a much broader panoply of tools and policies uh, that should be mutually supportive to, to achieve uh, sustainability goals. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diane. Um, so not to keep you um, any longer from your sustaining morning tea, um, I'd like to thank, um, and I hope you'll join me in thanking Stephen and Diane very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.